This, is the HFS-10 Geiger counter. It's a very low cost, Chinese radiation detector, and today I am going to perform a full review and teardown. I have been given a hot tip, from a high level industry insider, that this may be the unicorn, that I have spent so long searching for. So, I got my inside information, from none other than, Weapons and Stuff 93. A veritable goldmine of information on experimental safety procedures, and a man who has become, a legend in his own lunchtime. So there is now actually a genuinely good cheap Chinese Geiger counter, so it's this model. If this chap says it's good, then I'm sure it must be fantastic. But let's give it a quick test, just for fun. Whilst the color scheme is a little funky, the overall aesthetics of this product are quite nice. It comes with a well-padded carry case and a wrist strap. The device itself is nice and compact and has a robust feel to it. The display is clear and bright, it is a backlit TFT type, so you will be able to read it outdoors, and even under strong lighting conditions. The HFS-10, also has a decent metal belt clip, and this adds to the feeling of being a rugged little product. The user interface of the product, is pretty straightforward, and needs only three keys, and these have a responsive tactile feeling to them. Sadly, the designers didn't think to include a bar graph that shows dose rate versus time, I find this to be a really useful feature of any detector. And now for the best feature. The product can produce particle clicks, and not just that, the clicks are good and loud. The sound is a little scratchy, but then, beggars can't be choosers. The HFS-10 uses an internal lithium-ion battery, which is charged via the USB connector. The manufacturer claims that this device can operate for 20 days on a single charge, that said, when the display is on, and at full brightness, the battery will only last 40 hours. This is a classic OEM product. This means that a factory has designed this device and then sells it to whatever brands wish to buy it. So, just because you see this product with a different brand, or a different part number, or even in different colors, it does not mean the product is fake, it just means that different brand owners bought it from the factory. Okay, so far so good, let's get on and test this sucker. The first test for this detector will be a background radiation measurement. Let's see how it compares to some of my other detectors. This value is the instantaneous dose rate and this is the average. The figure at the bottom is the total accumulated dose. What is strange about the average measurement is although it seems to be about correct, the instantaneous values are always lower than this. This is pretty suspicious. Looking at the average over 5 minutes, the HFS-10, seems to be getting a pretty accurate level of the background radiation, but there are some red flags about how it might be achieving this. Next, I am testing the response to an americium 241 source. For a detector using a Geiger-Muller tube, I would normally expect this to measure at about 3 microsieverts per hour. But the HFS-10, is only capable of getting a reading that is about one quarter of that. I also tested with some of my other check sources, namely, cesium-137, radium-226, natural uranium and strontium-90. All of these gave very low readings, about four to five times lower than I would have expected. The product datasheet states that the device is capable of detection of beta, gamma and X-ray radiation. It seems that the device is just not sensitive to beta radiation at all, and that the gamma sensitivity is also quite low. It also seems that the calibration is abnormal, instead of a single conversion factor, taken from the tube data, 
it appears that at low dose rates, the device uses one calibration factor, and above about one microsievert, it uses another. Here we can see a very bright beta source, strontium-90, being placed in close proximity to the GM tube. The source produces a wide beta spectrum, with an upper bound of about 550 kilo electron volts, and the device is completely missing this. It seems that only the associated Bremsstrahlung X-rays are being detected. What a shame! Looking at the top of the PCB, we can see the main component of the product, the GM tube, and this one is a piece of crap, I have encountered this horrible Geiger Muller tube before. Basically, everything that is wrong with this product, can be traced back to this shitty excuse for a tube. Here, there is the high voltage power supply that generates the tube voltage. This, is the battery charger. Here, is the MCU, the brain of the product. Typically, these kind of low cost counters, use an STM clone with an M0 processor at its heart. This device uses an unusual MCU, it is the 16-bit equivalent, of the old 8051. I'm guessing it is a very low cost option. Here is an audio amplifier. Unlike other devices that I have reviewed, this product does not use a simple piezo sounder, it uses a fully fledged, miniature speaker driver. As such, it also requires a real amplifier that is capable of driving it. Here, is the connector and flexi for the LCD. And finally, there is the USB connector. This only provides power to the product, the data pins are not connected so cannot even be used for firmware upgrades. Looking at the back of the board, we can see the TFD display. The LEDs are also on the back of the board. And also, is the speaker driver and the three keys. So, it turns out, that Mr. Weapons and Stuff, gave us all a rather poor piece of advice. Because of the cheap tube, this is a pretty shitty product. And because of the small size of the device, I can't even fit a decent tube inside it. So perhaps, I need to send it off, to the Great Geiger Graveyard, to meet the Gamma Scout. Or, perhaps there is another way that this problem can be solved. After all, violence is never a good answer, to our problems. Perhaps, there is a way to add an external probe, with a better tube. Let's find out. So, I designed an external probe that could house a better Geiger Muller tube, the J321. Here is a rendering of what I had in mind. Obviously, it goes without saying, that products always end up looking exactly like the renderings their designers created. You can just look at Kickstarter, if you want proof of that. It was just a matter of printing the parts out, and then carefully assembling the probe and the wiring inside the HFS-10. Here is the basic wiring diagram I have used, this allows me to switch between the existing internal tube, and the external one when it is connected. I cut this track, here on the PCB. I did this to allow me to keep the anode resistor with the tube. They are a matched pair. These are the main parts for the external probe. I use SMA connectors, so it is interchangeable. It needed a bit of hand working of the 3D printed parts, but in the end, everything fitted well. I gave the parts a coat of paint to match the main unit, and now it's ready to be assembled. If anyone is wondering, why I didn't use a bigger and better tube, well the reason is due to the size limitations of the carry case. I decided to paint the GM tube, at the time, I was concerned about ultraviolet light causing false triggering. 
I actually made a separate video about that, the experiments I did led to some interesting results. I painted it orange, to match the groovy color scheme of the product. I bought a small 2-core coily cable, and fitted SMA connectors on each end. Here, you can see the SMA connector on the HFS10, and also the 2-pole changeover switch. At this point, I do need to issue a disclaimer. This upgrade is a lot more challenging than the simple one I did with the GC1 product. You should only attempt to make this upgrade if you feel totally comfortable with what is involved. I had to create a horrible, wiring salad inside the unit, and doing that, tested the limits of my patience. And, do not buy an HFS-10, explicitly to make this upgrade. There are better, cheaper counters, that you can use for that purpose. One thing is for sure, this upgrade has increased the sensitivity by about a factor of three. But it needs to be remembered, that there appears to be two different calibration coefficients used in the HFS-10. One of the few redeeming features of this product, is that the calibration factor can be set within the menu. This is only the calibration for dose rates over 1 microsievert per hour. This means that dose rates lower than that, such as for background radiation measurements, will not be able to be calibrated correctly. Another thing I find strange, is that the HH442 tube datasheet, indicates that the tube is only sensitive to X and gamma rays, and that the stated sensitivity is based upon cobalt-60 gamma emissions. But, the product datasheet claims the device is sensitive to beta, X-ray and gamma, and the sensitivity is quoted with respect to cesium-137 gamma emissions. Normally, I would perform a full retest of this product, and demonstrate the performance of this new tube. In this case I am going to hold off on that for a follow-on video. I have some ideas for some new tubes I can add to this device. In general, I am pretty pleased with the way that this upgrade went, the device now has pretty good sensitivity and, to my simple tastes, it looks pretty cool too. What's nice, is that there is still enough space in that carry case, for some more homemade probes. So, keep an eye out for the additional upgrades to this instrument. And as for this chap, well clearly, he is a complete wally. Here he is, talking about his high-powered X-ray gun. Judging by the content on his channel, it seems he is routinely imaging various parts of his body, using this 60 kV source. Somehow, I doubt that 60 kV is enough to see through his very thick skull. And finally, before I close out this video, I want to share some exciting news with everyone. Whilst the HFS-10 didn't turn out to be any kind of hidden gem, I might have found another low-cost device, that I think is a serious contender for the title of, The Perfect Cheap Geiger Counter. Stay tuned. Anyway, that is all I have for you today. I hope you enjoyed my little video, or at least found some parts of it interesting. If you want to see more of this kind of video, you could always press the subscribe button. This is not a commercial channel, nor will it ever be, so I can say what I want, and YouTube's algorithm can go and get f***ed. Thank you for your time.